Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. After understanding the system development life cycle, the stages that are needed in developing an information system, now we can uh, find out about the methodologies and the approaches that could be done in the development of information systems. So uh, there are structured methodologies and object-oriented methodologies. The structured ones would be, uh, it's it's step by step, it's progressive, meaning that after you finish one part, you can't go back again, but you have to go to the next part. It focuses on process in which you separate data from the processes. Now, a good tool that you could use for uh, this methodology is the data flow diagram. So uh, it's basically a representation of the components and data and the flow of data in a system. And then you can have a high level system and a lower level system. The high level system would be a more simple uh, diagram. You can also call it the context diagram. And then a lower level system would be the level N diagram in which, in which you show the more integrated details of the system. Here's an example. You can see uh, this, the student here, this is an entity and this box here. The other box here is a process. So you have three processes, you have an entity here. And then this is a database or a data store. And the arrows here shows how the data flows. And then this is uh, what happens with uh, the data. So you can see here, this is uh, an online registration for courses that a student takes. First, the student requests for a certain course and in process one, point zero, the system would be verifying whether the course is available or not. Maybe it's in another semester, for instance, not that semester. And then if it's accepted, if the course is available, then the student is enrolled. And then here the data goes into the database, the course file database, uh, to record that the student is enrolled. And then the data here is sent to the system to indicate that the course would be opened because there's a student applying. And then from the course file, uh, data would be given on the course details. While the student details, the name of the student, the address of the student and so on would be sent the data would be sent to the student master file because this is, let's say, a new student. Then it goes to the student uh, database from process 2.0. Then uh, you do registration and 3.0 would be confirming the registration. And then a confirmation letter is sent to the student. Now, this is an example of a data flow diagram. And here, here's a higher level structure chart. So uh, this shows not just one specific process, but the whole process of the system. Let's say uh, the uh, process of paying the salaries. You have uh, validate inputs, calculate payments, and write the outputs, each with uh, a sub uh, system there. The second one would be object-oriented development. So uh, this is uh, having objects, tangible objects that you can see on the screen that actually already has certain programming in it. And then you can uh, just uh, take a certain object, put it together with another object, and these objects are actually models that you can combine together to make a system. And here, for example, you have the employee system. Uh, this is the database. And then you can separate it into employees that are uh, paid 
monthly, hourly, or just temporary workers. Okay, so object-oriented development is iterative because you have certain modules that you can use again and again. So it's reusable. Another methodology would be computer-aided software engineering. So there are actually tools that help you automate uh, the business process. So uh, it, it helps you uh, write the algorithms without actually uh, doing much programming. And then aside from that, there are uh, different system building methods as well. Here you have the traditional systems development life cycle. So this is uh, the SDLC, the six processes that uh, is analysis, design, and so on. You have prototyping and user development, application software package, and outsourcing. So uh, the first one is the system development life cycle. It's also called waterfall because you finish one stage and then it goes down. And then after that, you finish the second stage, it goes down again and so on. So it's uh, progressive. You can turn back to the previous one. It's good for large systems, but it's time consuming, costly. It's not flexible. Also, the users are not really involved, engaged because uh, the work is mostly done by the consultants or the information system specialists. The second one would be prototyping. Now, prototyping is basically, uh, you would first identify what are the requirements and then you make a prototype. The prototype might, might come from uh, another company. For instance, if it's a consultant that's making this, uh, they might have a working prototype that, that they made for another company with a similar process, maybe with a similar size. And then the prototype is used by the user. If the user is satisfied, then the operational prototype is made. If the user is not satisfied, then it would be revised and enhanced and then made into the second a draft of the prototype, it's tried again by the user and so on until the user is satisfied. So this way, it's faster because you start with a prototype that's already available. And then uh, the user is engaged in fault in the development. The user actually ties the system. And the role of the user is very important because it's a matter of perspective also. If the user thinks that they have not been uh, trained about the system, they have not been uh, engaged, not interacting with the system before, then they might feel that it's not their system. But if they're engaged, if they're uh, involved in the development, then they would feel that it's something that they have built together and it's their system and they would be using the system. That's why user involvement is very, very important. Now, the next one would be end user development. In this case, the user themselves would be learning how to program and then making the actual uh, program itself. Of course, it would be uh, for simple programs and using user-friendly programming languages. Uh, it might be quick, but it might not be standard. So you might not be able to make a very good system. And it might, for instance, if you make another system, uh, then it might not be able to connect because different people or different uh, teams are making it with different experiences. And uh, the way they make the system might not be standard. The database might not be standardized and so on. Application software packages are applications that you buy off the shelves that are ready made. Like if you buy Windows, for instance, that's an application software package. It saves, it saves time and money. It's quick. 
you just buy it, like buying a clothing in a shop, and it's cheaper because the same system is used by uh, several companies. But then it might not fit your needs. It might have functions that you need, but it doesn't have. It might have functions that you don't need. The business process that's used in the software might be different from your business process. So you might need to customize it. And customization usually is expensive. And the next one would be outsourcing. Outsourcing meaning that you would be using a system that's operated by another company. For instance, uh, salesforce.com would be providing a sales management software. You just subscribe, pay a certain amount. They'll be giving you a username and password, and then you just log in, and then you directly use the system. So it's called SaaS or software as a service, not as a product, but as a service. You pay, let's say, monthly or based on the number of users, for instance. And uh, of course, it's, it's quick. You don't have to install anything. You don't need any specific infrastructure. But then you would be dependent on the providers okay? because they have your data. And it's not easy to switch to another vendor. And it's not flexible if you want to, uh, if you want to add up. So it depends on what they offer. It might be flexible in terms of uh, if they offer a, a complete package, you can just first try package A and then go to package B and so on by adding more uh, subscription fees. But then, uh, of, of course, there are hidden costs as well. The costs that are uh, not directly apparent, like here, for instance. So there's a vendor selection cost, transition cost, and so on. So these are the hidden costs. When you subscribe or outsource your software, and it might be a uh, uh, best case scenario, it might be a worst case scenario, and then uh, you would be able to see the, uh, the range of costs. It might, the actual one, uh, let's say it's $10 million, but actually the total cost might be between 11 and a half million to 15.7 million if you add on the hidden costs there. And we also have rapid application development in which uh, the system is made very quickly using special tools, using visual programming. And then you have joint application design in which all the users, several users would be coming together, discussing together, having a focus group discussion in order to accelerate generation of information requirements. So the system analyst doesn't just go to a user one by one, but the users are all put together discussing what they need. And it makes it uh, quicker. The development of the system would be quicker. It's called joint application design. And then you have agile development. So agile development uh, is the process of breaking down a large project into smaller sub-projects. And then each sub-project is uh, made separately. Uh, so that's why it's agile because it, it's small and then it's uh, quicker to develop at the uh, sub-project stage. You could also have component-based development. So uh, you, you make modules and then those modules could be combined and they could also be uh, put online and put together by, uh, used together by different parts of the organization. And you have uh, also mobile application development. So uh, now people tend to use systems using their handphones. Uh, then in that case, you would have to uh, think about smaller screens, whether it's still easy to use on a small screen, not on a computer, 
but using the mobile phone. How do you use the multi-touch gestures? How do you save memory and uh, processes, processing power? And then uh, this is something that we have to start thinking about because more and more companies are going mobile and the workers are also uh, working remotely. Thank you very much. I hope this would be a good start for us to start actually trying to uh, design systems and uh, get to know about how to build the systems. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.